Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. Thank you for coming. My name is Ed Brinkman. And a lot of you here know I entered with Teen Jeep this past summer. And I'll be going back there this coming summer. Uh, Teen Jeep is one of the largest uh, companies in the world. It's the largest consumer goods company in the world. And our purpose there is, is touching and improving lives. And I, can, I guarantee to all of you here that there's probably one P&G product that has in some way, shape, or form has touched your lives. And today I have the pleasure of introducing you to the person who is now in charge of that purpose. Uh, he's been with Procter & Gamble for over 30 years now. He's the president and CEO. And outside of Procter & Gamble, he holds many duties, uh, one being on the McKinsey Advisory Council, Another being the U.S. Advisory Committee of Trade Policy and Negotiations, which is directly appointed by the U.S. President, President of the United States. But even outside of that, outside of his career, uh, you know, he really takes the time out to, to really, really take the time out to make sure that everybody in his, in his company feels valued. You know, from his high executives all the way down to the summer intern. Now, there aren't many, there aren't many CEOs that invites the summer intern class into his home for dinner and take the time out to shake everybody's hand and have a conversation with each and every one of them. And I had that experience this summer as a marketing intern at KMG. So Tepper, we're extremely lucky to have him here today. And without further ado, please give a warm Tepper welcome to Bob Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ed didn't tell you that we served him baked beans and hot dogs. <laughs> Actually, we do have this program with the interns where we actually ask them to come to our hangar uh, at Lunkin Airport where we have our P&G hangar. We have five airplanes which are absolutely essential to running our business around the world. And it's a very popular event, so we have to only pick and choose some interns that can come, so we run a lottery. But I can't tell you how disappointed the interns are when they get there and they discover that they're not going up in the airplanes. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun, it's a lot of fun. While I'm here today, I want to talk to you a little bit about purpose-inspired innovation. Uh, Ed talked about the importance of our purpose. Uh, we've been around as a company for 175 years. Uh, it'll be 175 years in October. And throughout that 175 years, it's the purpose of the company, touching and improving lives, that has been that beacon out there that has helped us get through world wars, economic depressions, recessions, and kept us focused on what's really important touching and improving lives. And we believe that a company should do well financially as well as do good at the same time. We don't see that to be contradictory. In fact, we see tremendous congruence. We integrate responsibility for improving lives into everything that we do. We improve lives with our products, like Ed talked about. He worked on the Tide brand. Uh, we improve lives through our philanthropy. We improve lives through the community service of our employees. Uh, we actually fund trips for our employees, for example, to go to Mexico, which they did recently, and build homes with Habitat for Humanity. We think that's important for our business because that way our employees can get to know those consumers and get to realize that there are people out there whose lives we can touch and improve. So we believe we have to do well and do good at the same time, and that we want to create this virtuous cycle of doing well and doing good. We've taken this purpose of touching and improving lives and we've turned it into our growth strategy. We call it the Purpose Inspire Growth Strategy. We want to touch and improve more consumer lives in more parts of the world more completely. That's what we're all working hard to do. There are three parts to this strategy. More consumers means we want to have a vertical portfolio of products in every category we compete in. For example, Ed worked this summer on Tide, and he's going back to the Tide brand. In the laundry category in the United States, if you want the very best cleaning and care for your clothes, you buy Tide Total Care. Tide Total Care at your local Giant Eagle would be about a 160 price index versus regular Tide. Or if you didn't need that much cleaning performance, you didn't need that much care for your clothes, you might go and you might buy ERA. 
which is about a 65 index in price versus regular Tide. But the point is, no matter what your desire in terms of the cleaning performance or value of what you're willing to spend, we have a Procter & Gamble product all along that price tier designed to meet the needs of the consumer. More Parts of the World is about taking all of our 39 product categories and getting them into all countries of the world. We're in about 200 countries around the world. In the United States, where we've been for 175 years, we're in 38 of 39 product categories. But in a place like China, where we entered in 1988, we're the largest consumer goods company in China with about $5 billion in sales. We have about 8,000 Chinese employees, but we're only in about 15 product categories. So we have a lot of work to do to get the other 20 plus product categories into China. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as taking the US product and shipping it to China. That won't work. Chinese needs are different, and we have to figure out those needs and design a product to improve Chinese lives. And then more completely is about getting all adjacent categories in. For example, if you put in hair care, we want to put in conditioner, finishing rinse, and also developing wholly new categories that you've not even thought about or that I've not even thought about. Categories like Swiffer. We invented a product called Swiffer. It used our paper technology, our chemistry technology, and our apparatus technology in order to help people clean floors. So that's our purpose-inspired growth strategy. We think this is the strategy that's right for Procter & Gamble. It plays to our strengths. We have five strengths. Innovation, go-to-market capability, branding, global scale, consumer knowledge. This plays to our strengths. And it's fueled by innovation, which is one of those five strengths I, I discussed. Innovation for the Procter & Gamble company is our lifeblood. It's the primary way that we improve people's lives is through our innovation. We have a history of innovation as, the comp as a company. We were the first company to uh, run advertising in the United States. We were the first company to develop a stannous fluoride toothpaste in Crest. The first company to invent a uh, synthetic laundry detergent in Tide. The first company to invent a disposable baby diaper in Pampers. And I already talked about Swiffer. So we have a history of innovation, and innovation is critically important to the company's success. Innovation is not only in the new products we develop. Innovation is also in the way we go to market. It's in the way we do things. We were the first company to do color print ads. We were the first company to create a research and development department. We were the first company to create a profit-sharing trust program for employees. So every employee is an owner of the company, and we have the highest percentage of stock of any Fortune 500 company owned by company employees. We were the first company to invent brand management, the first company to invent customer business development. So innovation is everybody's job, and it transcends everything that we do within the company. I want to share some examples with you about how we touch lives through innovation. This is a story of a lady named Sandeya in, uh, in India. Uh, in this case, we invented a new Tide product that provided cleaning results that, uh, that she was looking for at a, uh, a good price. But let her tell the story. Please watch. <laughs> सुबह मैं उठती हूँ और उठ के फ्रेश होती हूँ और उसके बाद नाश्ता बनाती हूँ नाश्ता बनाने के बाद मैं उनको देकर लंच उनका डालती हूँ और उसके बाद बच्चे को तैयार करती हूँ बच्चों को फिर स्कूल भेजती हूँ फिर अपना घर के काम निपटाती हूँ सफाइयाँ करती हूँ सफाई की जाएंगी सफाई करके फिर मैं कपड़े भिगो देती हूँ धोने के लिए उसकी बात है कि सारे सफाई करती हूँ और सबसे लास्ट में मैं कपड़े धोती हूँ परिवार के साफ कपड़े तो बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण तो है ये अच्छे के लिए साफ कपड़े वो हमेशा मंगाती है सब अच्छे कहते हैं कि हाँ बहुत अच्छे सफाई बहुत अच्छी है टाइम मेरे को मदद इसलिए मदद करता है क्योंकि इसमें इतने समय बहुत ही कम लेता है और हाथ भी अच्छे रखता है और कपड़े की सफाई इतनी अच्छी धोता है पहले तो मेरे को बहुत टाइम लगता था कपड़े धोते हुए 
इनकी शर्ट में निशान निशान होते थे तो वो नहीं मिटते थे उनको मैंने इनको बताया नहीं है कि मैं ने चेंज कर लिया है कॉलर तो मैंने ये चेंज किया तो मैंने इनको नहीं बताया तो निशान उसे मिट गया तो ये मुझसे पूछने लगे भी ये नहीं अब तो कपड़ों में मतलब बहुत अच्छा हुआ रहा है मतलब चमक से आ रही है निशान क्या था मीठा आप कौन सा पाउडर यूज कर रहे हैं और मेरे को भी कोई चिंता नहीं होती क्योंकि मैं सबसे अच्छा काम मुझे यही लगता है कपड़े दौरा I go in the world one of the first things I do is I go into consumers homes and I watch them use our products or I talk to them about the tension that's in their lives and we try to figure out how we can improve their lives so we spend a lot of time with consumers learning about those stories that you just saw in order to figure out how to touch and improve their lives Another example of innovation is what we call commercial innovation it's really the I- the ideas that we come up with to better sell our products. And you may have heard we're a, an, an Olympic sponsor. We're one of the sponsors of the upcoming Olympic Games uh, in London, and we've signed an agreement with the International Olympic Committee to sponsor the Olympics over the next uh, five years, the next 10 Olympics. And uh, the reason we're doing this is there's a tremendous intersection between the Olympics, who are trying to improve lives through sport, and what we're trying to do to improve lives through our brands. This is the biggest agreement the Olympic Committee has ever signed because most companies that are sponsors have one brand, their company. In our case, as you can see here, we have about 60 brands and we're sponsoring the Olympic teams in all the countries uh, that are participating in the Olympics with the exception of one. We also have a number of athletes. Every one of our brands uh, has their own uh, Olympic athlete who will be the spokesperson for that brand. We started this around the Vancouver Olympics. We sponsored the US Olympic team for the Vancouver Olympics and we discovered that this was a good way to get in touch with our consumers. When we originally went to Vancouver, uh we we came up with the idea that we wanted to thank the mothers of the Olympic athletes. Uh mothers are our consumers. Mothers are the unsung heroes in life. Anybody here not have a mother? I didn't think so. Everybody has a mother and everybody loves their mother and everybody realizes that their mother sacrificed for them to get to where they are. This is a picture of Seth Westcott, the gold medal winner, and uh, his mother Margaret. And uh one of the things we did when we went to Vancouver is we got to know the athletes uh and their mothers. And we developed an insight. The insight was very simple. It's the insight is that no matter how much the mother sacrifices for the child and no matter how old the child becomes or accomplished the child becomes that that child uh, is always looked at as a child to their mother now in this particular case uh margaret has always uh supported scott every step of the way and has sacrificed uh throughout his life so we created a campaign to thank moms and i want to share with you an advertisement from the Vancouver Olympic Games which is the number one rated advertisement according to the New York Times for the Olympics please watch when you walk through a storm hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark walk sponsor of moms during the time we aired this ad and during the time we sponsored the olympics we generated about 100 million dollars of incremental sales uh in the united states 
When we went to Vancouver, we were surprised. What we discovered when we got there was the families had no place to see their Olympic athletes. The Olympic athletes, the families are not allowed in the Olympic Village. So one of the things we did, driven by our purpose, was we created a P&G family home in Vancouver where the athletes could meet with their parents. And uh, of course, we had a room where you could eat Pringles and watch the Olympics on TV. We had a room for children uh, that was sponsored by Pampers. But again, it was the right thing to do. The other thing we discovered was many families couldn't afford to come to the Olympics, that they had sacrificed so much for their Olympic athlete children that they no longer had the money to travel to the Olympics. So we actually paid for them to come. Again, it was part of our purpose, part of our Olympic sponsorship, a commercial innovation, and a commercial innovation with a high rate of return on the business. So from that Olympic experience in Vancouver, we've now gone and become an international Olympic sponsor, and we've already started working on the London 2012 Olympic Games. In fact, we started around Mother's Day uh, in the UK. Mother's Day in the UK is a different time of year than it is in the United States. And we aired this ad, please watch. Mom. So that aired around Mother's Day in the UK and we're, we're now picking up steam uh, in our Olympic program as we move more closely to the London Olympics, which will be this summer. We're also a, a proud sponsor of the Youth Olympics and uh, we, we recently were involved in kicking off uh, the Youth Olympic Games, uh, which started on Mother's Day and will close in the London 2012. Um, we've actually put together a, a video for the Youth Olympics. Please watch. the moms of the world this summer during the London Olympic Games. Innovation also uh, goes to our social responsibility work. Obviously with a purpose of improving lives, you've got to take care of the environment and you have to do other things to take care of people in need. One of the things uh, we do is we've created a, a packet, a packet of chemistry called the PNG water purifier packet and uh, 4,000 children die every single day from dysentery or diarrhea somewhere in the world. I've been in many of these countries. I've lived in many of these countries. You go upstream and you see a water buffalo or a carabao defecating in the water. You go downstream and you see a, a little boy with a pail and water coming out of a pipe. He doesn't know where it's coming from and that's the family water. There's no reason that 4,000 children should die a day from drinking unsafe water. Well, we can help. These packets clean up 10 liters of water, which provides enough water for a family for a day. So far, we've saved more than 22,000 lives, but we've got more work to do. Please watch. To over 1 billion people around the developing world, this is considered drinking water. And it doesn't just taste bad, 
Diseases from this water are killing more kids every year than HIV AIDS and malaria combined. 4,000 kids every single day. We refuse to accept this, so we're doing something about it. It's called a pure packet, and it's quite simply a miracle to those who need it. One pure packet transforms 10 liters of water contaminated with bacteria and viruses into clean drinking water. And for many, it's the difference between life and death. Imagine seeing and tasting clean water for the very first time. I was at the uh, Clinton Global Initiative uh, with President Clinton a couple of years ago, and that was where we made the commitment to save one life every hour by the year 2020. To get there, we've got to triple the size of our plant in Pakistan to make more of these packets, and we're building a new factory uh, in Singapore um, in order to do that. But you can make a difference, too. The way you can make a difference is if you go to facebook.com, pg.childrensafedrinkingwater, CSDW, click on the like, and uh, one like will provide one day of clean drinking water. Um, and this is a program that we're doing with Facebook in order to provide more clean drinking water uh, in order to prevent more deaths. There I am on stage with President Clinton, uh, Melinda Gates, and, and others. Uh, and this is where we made the commitment to save one life every hour um, by 2020. And we're on track to do that, but obviously we have more work to do. Uh, it means we'll have to provide over 2 billion liters of clean water every year. And so far, since we started the program, we've done about 2 billion liters of clean water. So we have work to do. But innovation is critical and uh, to getting this done. Um, please watch. The companies I work with, hardly anybody has any bigger dreams than P&G. What did you say at our meeting? You're gonna save a life an hour from now on? Every hour. Yeah, from now on. That's a pretty nice dream for one corporation in a big world that's highly competitive. Just think, even for your side, if every business incorporated in every developed country prorated that commitment down to people with 20 employees that had a fraction of your income. Everybody prorated that commitment. God only knows how many people would be saved. So that's why I honor P&G. Big dreams, song in your heart, reality-based strategy, keep score, doesn't work, we'll do something else. If we can learn to live that way, we can get beyond our political and other divisions, and there's not a thing wrong with the country or the world that we can't make better. So that's what we try to do. Our purpose is to touch and improve lives. We touch and improve lives through our brands. We do it through our philanthropy. We do it through our community service, all of which is informed by the innovation. Innovation is the primary way that we touch and improve lives and we make a difference. If you're interested in joining Procter & Gamble, making a difference uh, in, in the world, uh, please come join us. Uh, with me today, I brought uh, Scott Eisenhart, uh, who is in our talent supply organization, Scott Whalen, who runs our recruiting at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, and there's several other uh, P&Gers in the room. Or go to experiencepng.com uh, if you're interested in an internship or a full-time career in making a difference in the world. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. Any questions or comments? Thank you. Questions, reactions, comments? It's a bashful group. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, Pete Nate. Uh, my name is Aaron Adderman. I'm a second year. Um, Thank you. Being a U.S. company, and you mentioned Pakistan as a place you have a, a presence now at our factory, with what's going on in the world and a lot of the uprisings and things in that area, um, how is a U.S. company mitigating some of the risks of being in some parts of the world right now? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Aaron. Um, we operate in almost every country of the world. Uh, the, one, the only ones we don't operate in are the ones where we're not allowed to by law in the United States. 
And our first and primary concern is, is the safety of our people. So for example, um, when the uprising occurred in Egypt, uh, we shut down our factory. We had our employees stay home. And it was only after things were safe again that uh, the employees uh, went back to work. We have a security organization around the world that monitors uh, these kinds of things, I think, better than most news services. Uh, we tend to know what's going on. We're in the fabric of the country. Most of our people are local, national people. Um, and as a result of that, we're able to react relatively quickly. Um, we have, we fortunately have not had any, ins any issues at all, but we are very conservative in taking care of folks. Actually, we just won an award uh, last week. Um, I was in the State Department last week. Uh, we won the Secretary of State's Corporate um, Excellence Award. Uh, and I was in, uh, there I am. I was in the State Department <laughs> with, uh, with Secretary Clinton. Every year, the ambassadors around the world nominate companies who are making a difference in the lives of the people in their country. Uh, this year, there were 65 nominations from ambassadors around the world. There were 13 finalists. Procter & Gamble was the only company in the history of the award to be nominated and have two finalists. We had a finalist for the work we were doing in Nigeria and a finalist for the work we are doing in Pakistan. And so uh, that's why I have two awards up there, one for Nigeria, one for Pakistan. Um, and uh, Am Ambassador um, Munter was there, the ambassador to Pakistan. And we had a, a telepresence uh, video conference hookup with the people in Pakistan uh, so Secretary Clinton and I could, um, could talk to them. So it was a, great, a great, great recognition by the US government for the work we're trying to do to improve people's lives. But of course, we have to take care of our employees first, or nothing gets done. Thank you for the question, Aaron. Other questions, comments? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. So how yes, do you you were talking to us upstairs. Uh, so this is a question regarding leadership and uh, time management. So I noticed you mentioned about in our conversation, you mentioned about you read about the beautiful last uh, super curve. And you're running, at the same time, you're a CEO running a $79 billion company. How do you find the time to actually acquire so much knowledge? And at the same time, such a big company. Well, one, one of my uh, beliefs in leadership is that uh, you have to constantly work to learn new things. And uh, uh, in fact, if you're interested in my beliefs on leadership, you can find them on the Procter & Gamble website. Um, do you have that, Tom? Is it? You can pull it up. Um, you have to constantly work to learn new things. I believe in Stephen Covey's thought in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People of constantly sharpening your saw as a leader. And this becomes more important today than ever before because things are changing much more quickly today than ever before. So I constantly am reading uh, a, a new book. Um, in fact, if you went into my library at home, uh, you would see quite a number of books. Um, but you would think that book publishing stopped the time I got my Kindle. So uh, I do have a Kindle Fire. I had a Kindle before that, but it wore out. And, uh, and I have a number of books on my, on my Kindle. Fortunately, I travel a lot. And because I travel a lot, uh, I have a lot of time to read on airplanes. Um, so I, I do believe that's important. And I would encourage you, when you graduate, uh, not to think that your learning is over. It's only begun. And one thing you could learn a lot about or study is leadership. And this is a copy of my uh, leadership bibliography. These are the best books on leadership that I've read. And uh, this is also available on the Procter & Gamble website, which was the previous um, URL that we showed. Thanks, Jack, for the question. Other questions, comments? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Naveen, uh, a second-year MBA. And, Pleasure uh, to meet you. <laughs> Pleased to meet you, too. And I had a quick question on uh, the water purifier packet product that you had. One of the challenges could be the access to the market and the sales channels. If we talk about some of the innovations in remote parts of the world where this product is actually required that you worked on. Yeah, it's, that's a great point. In fact, when we first went into this business, we expected it would be a for-profit business. And what we discovered was we couldn't, we couldn't make it a for-profit business. So actually, we make no money 
on those packets. Uh, we, we work with aid agencies. We sell them at cost. And uh, we work with people like uh, PSI, Save the Children, Red Cross, Red Crescent, over 100 aid agencies that are out in these rural areas where there isn't an economy. And they're the ones who help us uh, save people's lives. The reason that we do that is that these packets take about 20 minutes to use. And you, you would be amazed, because I've been there. When you're stirring this, to wait that 20 minutes to kill the bacteria and viruses uh, is really a difficult 20 minutes for somebody to wait when they're thirsty. And so it's the aid people who help us clean the water and teach the people how to use the packets so that they're used properly. But you're absolutely right. Deep distribution is difficult where no economies exist. One of the things we're working on is getting deep distribution around the world. We have a program with the Chinese government called 10,000 Villages. Because of the scale of the number of products we sell, we can actually go into a place where an economy doesn't exist, open up our van, sell our products, and create an economy. Do you have the Mr. Ferris video? I want to show you, I want to show you a video. It's, a, it's an interesting story. There's a guy by the name of Mr. Ferris, and he lives in a very rural area of Morocco. In fact, in this area, there is no economy. And uh, basically, uh, Mr. Ferris, uh, we decided that we would put him into business. So working with our distributor, we helped him open a store. And basically what happens in these rural areas around the world is the store is the home, actually, and the person just sells the product out of their home. And that's the way the economy gets started. And so watch, watch this video. This is a story. شركة قالي بنعونك بيتي الله يخرف عليكم وبيدا شيء بيتك أنا بيتكم تعاونوني وبيتكم ت ت طلعوني فوق شوية بيتنا نطلع نطلع شوية نعد هالناس نوكا إدرت ال المحل إدرت هذاك شيء تزوجت شت مثل الناس وكاش الناس أنا يا وكازوجت بها ودرت الناس شوية قياس قياس الحال ديال مسكين It's kind of humorous, but when you meet Mr. Ferris, one of the things he will tell you is he had no job, he had no hope, he had no family, and he was born with a handicap. And because of his relationship with the Procter & Gamble company, he now is the richest man in his village. He's married. He has a son, which is really a big deal. And he always says to me, Bob, when are you going to fix my leg, my handicap? <laughs> We're working on it. We're working on it. But there's so many ways that we improve people's lives, in, even in our operations, as we work to get to the world's people in rural areas. Yes, sir. My name is Matt, and I'm a first year. Um, so my question is, you spoke of distribution as being one of the hurdles to getting to reach more people. Can you talk about some of the others and some of the ways that you're getting over? Yeah. It's, it's a great question, because when you innovate, uh, we believe you have to innovate for each discrete person on the economic pyramid. We don't believe that you can just innovate for the person on the top and then dilute that product for the person on the bottom. Uh, one example I told earlier this morning, but I, I use it here, is one that we did when I was in the Philippines. Um, in the Philippines, where I, where I lived for four years, uh, you don't really have running water. The, the water runs by your street about a half hour each day. At our house, it was from 6 to 6.30. And you had a high horsepower pump on the street and a big tank in your yard so that as the water ran by for that half hour, you could pump as much as, it, as possible in your tank. As a result of that, water is very expensive. I mean, water is the world's biggest problem. The average woman in the world walks six kilometers a day to get water for her family. And then she collects firewood 
to boil that water. Water is a big, big problem. So the water is very expensive. Filipinos love clean clothes. And as a result of that, when they wash clothes, they typically wash them by hand. And they use a synthetic detergent bar. So they wash and wash and wash. And they measure the cleanliness of their clothes by the amount of suds they generate. And generally, they generate so many suds that it takes five bucket loads of water to clean those clothes, or to, to get the suds out of the clothes, to rinse the clothes. So we invented a product that we call Downy Single Rinse. Downy Single Rinse is much different than the Downy you would buy in the Giant Eagle or the Kroger here in Pittsburgh. Downy Single Rinse has a little bit of softness, a little bit of fragrance, but importantly, it has chemicals that will sequester the suds and allow you to rinse those clothes with only one rinse, one bucket of water, rather than five. So you can imagine the advertising campaign for that innovation. It's an innovative advertising campaign. This product is so good, you can rinse your clothes with one rinse, get fragrance and softness for free, because it's paid for by the water you save. So that's how we try to innovate for people at the bottom of the economic pyramid. It's, it's an interesting dichotomy, it's an interesting tension, because if you don't have the product, you won't get the deep distribution. If you don't have deep distribution, you can't sell the product. You have to work on both at the same time. It's a great question. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Juliana. Nice to Hi, Jill. I was uh, going on the improving life aspect of P&G, and I was wondering as to what kind of impact you think that will have on the uh, with recycling all your, your plastic products and stuff like that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we'll put up a, a chart here. What we've said uh, about sustainability is, first of all, with the purpose of improving lives, you've got to take care of the environment. You have no choice. And what we said is, we want to get to where we use 100% renewable materials in our products. Right now, we're selling Pantene Nature Fusions that the bottle was made with sugar cane, not with um, plastic. Uh, you can buy that in the stores. 100% renewable materials. 100% uh, renewable energy in our plants. So uh, uh, we just finished the completion of our first wind turbine in a, one of our plants in the Netherlands, which provides a great deal of power for that plant. We want nothing to go to landfill. We have 150 plants around the world. Right now, we have a, about a dozen plants where nothing goes to landfill. Everything goes into the product, nothing goes to landfill. Anything that leaves the plant leaves cleaner than it came in if it leaves. And finally, we want to develop products that are better for the environment. Products where, for example, they're more condensed, they're more concentrated, um, so there aren't as many chemicals then going into the environment. So we have a very strong program uh, of, of many facets that permeates our entire company and uh, is a big uh, uh, reason that we try to innovate to make products that are better for the environment. We just now are starting shipments on a brand new laundry detergent uh, called Tide Pods, which is the most concentrated laundry detergent you can buy anywhere in the world. So it's going to have less packaging, less chemistry, and it will get your clothes cleaner than anything else. So please buy it when you see it in the stores. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Yes, sir. My name's Reed. I'm a first year. I have a Hi, slightly Reed. more general question. Uh, clearly, you have to understand the consumer very well. With the uh, State of the Union tonight, what advice would you give President Obama for improving the economy here in the US? Well, yeah. <laughs> First of all, I have to say, I am apolitical. Uh, my political party is the Procter & Gamble Company. Um, and obviously, I, I would like the economy improved all over the world. My, my prescription for improving the economy is very simple. It's very simple. Um, what happens is, when, when the world economy slows down, the normal tendency of governments is to turn inward. And I would say that, typically, I see that in business. If a company is in trouble, the company tends to turn inward, when in reality what they need to do is turn externally. So uh, my advice would be, um, would be do more trade. Do more trade. Uh, there's no question that the more trade that's done between countries in the world, 
uh, the better the global economy does. And what happened after the 2008, 2009 beginning of the downturn of the economy was many countries put in place barriers to trade, whether it was tariffs or, uh, or, or other barriers to trade. So do more trade. Um, secondly, uh, please stop uh, all the regulation that is, uh, that is getting in the way of business. Um, and you know, right now, I think some regulation is certainly necessary, um, but we are working with the president to let him know what regulation we think gets in the way of doing business. Third, keep, uh, keep good relations with other countries. When uh, President Hu was coming to the United States, um, President Obama and I met in the Oval Office. I talked to him about doing business in China. He was very receptive. And uh, we've got to have the countries of the world working together. We can't be poking sticks in each other's eyes. Uh, that doesn't do any good for world trade. So I'm all about trying to improve lives, and, and I hope governments around the world are. And those are the kinds of things I would, I would work on. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm Hi, Sean. Um, I want to talk about leadership. Obviously, as you've moved out your career, you've had to increasingly rely on others to get things done. I'm just wondering if you could share some of the lessons that you've learned in terms of how to do that effectively. Well, did everybody hear Sean's question? Sean's question was about leadership. Uh, you know, what are the lessons uh, I've learned. Uh, if you go on our website, there are 10 leadership lessons that I, I have there, and they all tie back to different uh, experiences I've had uh, in my life. One of them, I won't go through all 10, but one of them uh, I think is the most critically important is the fact that everybody wants to succeed. Oftentimes, as leaders, we don't remember that. Uh, how many of you woke up this morning and said to yourself, I want to go to Carnegie Mellon, and I want to prove to every professor in every class that I am the world's biggest failure. <laughs> Raise your hand. Right? Have you ever met anybody in your life who wants to fail? Now, let me ask you another question. How many of you have too much time on your hands? <laughs> you just don't know what to do with all the time you've got. Right? So what do we do if we don't have time? Well, leadership is very time inefficient. If you try to be a time efficient leader, it won't work. Imagine the employee comes to you on a Friday evening before a three day weekend and says, I have a problem. And you say, I'm sorry, I I'm time efficient. I've got to go home. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. So there's a, there's, what happens is because we are so concerned about efficiency, we tend to focus on only the things going wrong. In our company, we have scorecards. Some things are green, some are colored yellow, some are colored red. And uh, we work on the things that are red to try to get them to be yellow or green. But leadership is really about focusing on the green. I mean, the easiest way to grow a business is to take what you're doing right and take it to the next level. Take that strength and take it to the next level. So as you think about it, try to spend more time catching people succeeding rather than only spending your time catching people failing. And I think you'll find you'll be a better leader. That would be one of my 10 beliefs. The other nine are on the website if you'd like to see them. I think. One more question. One more, OK. I just want to make sure I don't get Ed in trouble. <laughs> we want to make sure he graduates. Yes, sir. My name is Dave Bolin, and I'm a second year. I'm sorry? Yes. Uh, and I actually started out uh, wanting to be an artist. And one of the things I noticed when I was kind of Hang Wanting on. to be an artist? Yeah, no. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. What was your medium? Uh, drawing. I, I loved to draw. And uh, my dad worked in an ad agency in Chicago. And on the weekend when he would go to work, if, if that happened or I was with him, I would go in and he would put me in the creative room. I'm, for those of you who don't know the advertising industry, I might be talking in code. And I would draw storyboards, you know, which are the, the comic strips that make up television advertising. And at that time, Ernie Banks, one of the world's best baseball players, uh, a hero of mine, was a spokesperson for Coca-Cola in Chicago. So I would draw all these Ernie Banks ads. My dad never made any of them. <laughs> that kind of stunted my career. What's your story? <laughs> one of the things I noticed was that uh, creative people are very interested in what's cool. They want the next cool idea. 
but how do you make the leap from what's cool to what fits the purpose and improves someone's life? Yeah, I, I, I like that thought a lot. I want to turn it around. I want to improve somebody's life, and then I got to figure out how to make it cool, right? And so we have a whole department uh, of design. And uh, we believe very much in design thinking. Uh, we do a lot of work with IDEO and other design agencies. Uh, Roger Martin, uh, the dean of the Rotman School in Toronto, uh, has written a lot about the work that we do in design. But what we try to do is figure out the functionality of the product and then the design at the same time to make it cool. I mean, we're not obviously selling iPads and things like that, but, but we do work very, very hard on the design. And I think design thinking is, is a really critical skill. We, in our leadership training, we teach our leaders to not only think analytically, but we also teach them design thinking because we think that you've got to have that agility to be able to go from design thinking to analytical thinking and, and, and back. So I do think there's great value in it. And I think that's one of the competitive advantages of this institution. I mean, before you leave this institution, if you're in a business program and you're getting all that analytical quantitative thinking, go soak up some of the art, fine arts thinking and learn how to think uh, uh, design thinking wise because I think it's a great benefit of Carnegie Mellon. Was it, were you trying to make an ad for the school? <laughs> I was doing it for you. That's it, it's all for questions. Please give them a warm round of applause. Oh. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.